Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for the third of this year's NUGI lectures. For the first part of today, David Pollard, who I anticipate needs no introduction, will present an analysis of how, if at all, the idea of prudence informs or should inform the true content of trustees' investment duties. For the second part of today, Associate Professor Scott Donald will present on the related topic of the challenges for trustees in dealing with extreme risks. Scott is Director of the University of New South Wales's Centre for Law, Markets and Regulation. Scott joined the faculty there in 2010 after a successful career in the funds management industry advising governments, superannuation funds, insurance companies and fund managers on investment strategy, governance and regulation. So he is clearly really very well placed indeed to offer insights on the topic on which he's speaking at this event and Wilberforce is delighted to have him join us from Sydney today. Uh, we'll see how time goes but we might have a pause to address questions after David has presented and then again there will hopefully be the opportunity to address further questions after Scott has completed his presentation. If at any time you do wish to raise a question, please press the Q&A button and tap in your question there. You have the option of raising your question anonymously, though if you do reveal your identity and the speakers aren't able to respond live, we will certainly aim to get in touch with a response over the next couple of days. With all that said, it's time for me to hand over to David. Thank you, uh, James. Um, I have uh, been unfortunately not very prudent in the number of slides I've done. So this, uh, you'll be pleased to know, is the short version. Um, uh, so, but it's going to be a, a slight whistle-stop tour anyway, I think. Um, what I want to look at is, is uh, the duty of care that applies in relation to investment by Occupational Pension Scheme trustees. Um, and uh, we'll see quite a lot of that refers to prudence uh, and what that is. And, and we will come on to the, the Jilly Cooper book, uh, which gives massive insights uh, into this. Uh, but really, what, what, what is prudence the right term? What does prudence mean in this context? What does the duty of care actually mean? And uh, most of the case law uh, that we look at uh, is actually to do with private wealth trusts. So is that actually relevant for pension schemes and commercial trusts and things like that? Um, so I'll, I'll keep going as fast as I can. Uh, so I'm looking at the duty of care and skill. If you're a, tr a trustee board and it's managing investments in a pension scheme, uh, there are various provisions that apply you've got to you've got to only do authorized investments if you start doing unauthorized investments you've got bigger problems although there's a wide uh, implied power now anything that uh, an individual could uh, uh, an actual person could could get subject to any limitation in the trustee but that that width of the investment power which is a change from 100 years ago uh, in terms of the authorized investments does still mean the duty of care remains uh, that's the Nestle, Nestle judgment. You've got to invest for a proper purpose. That's a whole different topic. That raises its own issues in relation to, say, political risk. And you do things for political reasons. What about ESG factors? Why are you doing those and that sort of thing? Fiduciary duties apply as well, conflicts and things like that. Uh, and then there are a whole raft of statutory duties that I'll come on to. But I'm really looking at the duty of care and skill. Uh, 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 in relation to authorised investments and you're doing it for proper purpose and that sort of stuff. Uh, and this is pretty important stuff because there's quite a lot of turmoil going on uh, at the moment. You, you heard it from me first. Um, and uh, the duty of care in relation to investments for occupational pension scheme trustees is actually a fairly key point because uh, if you've got a scheme of any, any size, there's, there's millions, billions of pounds involved. Uh, in terms of assets. If it goes wrong, there's a potentially huge uh, liability and, and you, your exoneration provision in the trust deed, which might say you're only liable if you do something in bad faith or something, 
doesn't apply to investment matters. So that sort of parliament saying to you, look, you could be liable for this stuff as a, as a trustee. Having said which, there don't seem to be huge numbers of cases where, where trustees have been held liable. I, I'm going to also mention the pension schemes bill, which is still going through, and query whether if you get the investment wrong, that's going to be a criminal offence. It's going to be something we'll, we'll enjoy looking at. And what we all do is we start off by, if, if a trustee board says, well, okay, what, what are my duties in relation to investment? Uh, certainly I, I would quote, and I suspect all the books seem to quote, and the TPR stuff, uh, and we go back to these 1880 cases, Spate and Court and re Whiteney, and we talk about taking precautions which an ordinary prudent man of business would take. So uh, presumably an ordinary prudent person of business in the current days, and then in re Whiteney you get an ordinary prudent man would take it, he were minded to make an investment for the benefit of other people. So, so you, can, you can cite that to trustee boards uh, or, or anybody who wants to challenge what the trustees do and they'll probably nodge sagely uh, and think you've actually told them something that's helpful. Uh, but actually, when we come onto it, what does prudent mean? I'm, I'm prudent, I, my submission is just means be careful. So your duty of care in relation to investment is to be careful, which is not a hugely helpful um, summary of the, of the law. Um, Oh, huge helpful be just be careful and, and we're pointing back to these statutes to these judgments which are 130 years old uh, and that judgments aren't statutes we shouldn't just be construing them as though they are statutes there's lots of case law that says that they're cases that involve private wealth trusts in the victorian age uh, with limited implied authorized investment powers didn't have much inflation in those days perhaps we come back to that we don't have much inflation much less developed financial markets and things like that. And actually, arguably, back in the 1880s, in, uh, imposing a duty of prudence or duty of care relating to prudence was actually shifting things on for trustees from earlier cases, Gisborne and Gisborne in 18, slightly earlier, just talk about you're not liable if you act in good faith. Um, so a purely subjective standard, potentially, arguably, what does good faith mean? Um, and, and so it, maybe it's a, it's a greater duty of care, but anyway, We'll come on to it and say well really does this mean the same thing today or, or what does this duty of care do uh, and you got Lord Justice Hoffman as he then was in a 1994 paper in a book that Scott has edited um, most of the general statements of equitable principles which we use today are simply a way of putting the matter which occurred to some Victorian judge in the course of an extemporary judgment which his successors thought sufficiently felicitous to worth repeating. There is nothing sacred about such formulations and I do not see why Victorian judges should be regarded as having some special insight into the mot juste which and he was doing this at the time of the good committee report. Uh, what matters is not the source of the principle but whether the judges are willing to regard it as a principle rather than interpret it as black letter law. So that's uh, Lord Justice Hoffman ex-judiciary saying look really look at it at the time. Um, and so you can do searches for prudence and think about what does prudence mean? Is prudence the relevant description? Uh, and, and for some reason, I, I suddenly think of Scots people for being prudent for some reason. There's a sort of era of the Scottish widows, I sort of feel, is prudent. And Gordon Brown liked to be thought of as prudent. Uh, and there's a book which I bought um, talking about Gordon Brown's prudence and things like that. And then we, 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 uh, we move on to Jilly Cooper. So uh, as we said, I don't think prudence was very prudent in that book. Um, so what does it mean? So let, let's look at this. What does the legislation say? What does prudence mean? What's a better way of describing it? Uh, you can tell I'm not that keen on it as a, a description. Uh, what does the duty of care involve? Does this apply to pension trustees? And, uh, and inevitably we have to talk about Braganza. You can't do a talk without talking about Braganza. Well I can't anyway. Uh, so let's see how it goes. Um, <clears throat> Right, so you, you turn and look and say, okay, let's look at the legislation. What does that say? Uh, and there's quite there's a fair chunk of legislation on investment duties and things like that for trustees and for pension trustees. And slightly intriguingly, it doesn't really mention the word prudence. So there we are flinging out stuff from a, from a court decision in, in the 1880s, talking about prudence and, and where is it? Uh, I mean, it's in some of the overseas jurisdictions. Australia's got a prudence thing in there. Uh, Pensions Act 2004 does refer to prudent actuarial assumptions and things like that, but not really focusing on investment. So I'm focusing on investment. Jonathan Hilliard and Leonard Bowman gave an APL talk last year on, on the virtue of prudence and funding, but, but that was in relation to funding, not investment. 
Now, arguably, they, they, they cover the same area in some ways. But so, so we look at the, the legislation for, for trustees generally. It's the Trustee Act 2000. And that doesn't talk about prudence. That was a deliberate decision by the Law Commission. They wanted to codify the duties. And they thought uh, prudence isn't the modern terminology. Let's go for care and skill as is reasonable in the circumstances. And then with special levels of duty, uh, uh, enhanced duties of care, uh, if you're a professional trustee or if you have special knowledge or experience. So, so that's a sort of modern care. That's very similar to the level of care and skill that applies to directors. Again, codified in statute six years later. And there's, there's, a, there's a, a tie up between there. But the 2000 Act, we know, doesn't apply to investment functions of trustees and occupational pension scheme. So, so there we, we fall back on we am going back to the Pensions Act 1995, so five years earlier, uh, and there's some mentions of prudence in the investment regulations, and it's like, well, come on, are they? But actually, the Pensions Act 1995 does not give a general standard of care for pension trustees or for investment. What it does do is have Section 33 that says you can't exclude an obligation under in rule of law to take care or exercise skill. It doesn't say what that obligation is, but it says you can't exclude it. Uh, from a trustee or any delegate fund manager can't be excluded or restricted by any instrument of agreement. Section 33 is a tricky section and Fenner Moran looked at it in a new G lecture a couple of years ago. Um, but, but it doesn't actually define, the, define what's there. And you end up with, there's a whole load of stuff, 35, 34, 35, 36 about uh, how to invest, statement of investment principles, all that sort of stuff. And we end up with the investment regulations 2005. Um, trustees must exercise discretion in accordance with the list in the regulation. So it's got to be in the best interests. Well, I've discussed at length that that's a, an interesting duty. Uh, powers of investment, security, quality, liquidity and profitability, uh, appropriate to the nature and durations. It's all good stuff. Reg you've got to be a majority and regulated market. So it's sort of setting out this list uh, of obligations. Uh, got to be properly diversified. You can't have excessive risk concentration. And, and you can't go do for der derivative instruments. So it's sort of, it's sort of like the old list system. It's not like the old, the old list system, but what was an authorised investment. You could, you're authorised to invest in anything, but then you've got to comply with these restrictions. And that, that's all, and you've got to take advice and consult with the employer and all that sort of stuff. So it's setting up a framework uh, and it's designed to enact the requirements under the IOP, I, IOP directive. Um, but the IOP directive's got a prudent person bit in it. So if we look at the IOP directive, the original one, 2003, member states shall require institutions located in their territories to invest in accordance with the quotes, prudent person, close quotes rule, uh, and in accordance with the following rules. Um, and that's all it says. That's, that's what it says. It says the prudent person rule. doesn't define what the prudent person rule is. I think it sort of assumes you know what it means. Um, uh, and, and that's sort of intriguing. Anyway, when when we came, when when the UK came to enact the provisions that are in the IORP, it's a directive, so they have to enact it unless you're uh, a, a governmental entity, but you're to interpret to comply as far as possible. Um, we didn't put prudent person in the regulations. That was a deliberate decision by the government of the time. If you look at the response to consultation, lots of the consultation responses said, why haven't you put a prudent person rule in here? And they said, we don't want to, to uh, move away from the implied prudent person rule or something like that. So, so there is no statutory provision that says you have to do this. Um, uh, and prudent person comes up in, in other areas. It comes up in insolvency too, which talks about the prudent person principle as specified below. So, so in Europe, they clearly think there is a prudent person principle or a prudent person rule, uh, and, and presumably they know what it means. But I, I, I'll come back to this, but I think uh, it's arguable that actually what the prudent person principle is, prudent person rule is in the directive, is just the list of stuff underneath the directive, diversification, all that sort of stuff. And if you comply with that, you're complying with the prudent person principle. Seems arguable that actually there is no separate principle other than the list of things that are actually in the directive. Uh, and there's, there's very tendentious support for that by the Court of Appeal in the Palestine Solidarity case. This article places obligations on member states to require institutions to invest in accordance uh, with the prudent person rule as more particularly set out. So it's as more particularly set out. Uh, so it may be that IORP is thinking 
prudent person rule, it's what we've set out underneath. It's all the diversity stuff. There is no separate be cautious principle or anything like that. So immediately we think, okay, there's this word prudence floating around. What does it mean? So you turn to the Oxford English Dictionary and it's a sensible course of action, good sense in practical and financial affairs, discretion, circumspection, caution. So it's quite wide. I know, you know, what does it mean? Does it just mean be careful? And it's apparently a cardinal virtue. Um, jolly good. I'm not overly sure I know what a cardinal virtue is. Uh, and then by the time you get down to the fourth meaning, we have in fact got a gathering or group of vicars. So no doubt the prudent person rule is actually a gathering. Uh, and here are some vicars and me. There you go. Um, so does prudent um, prudence mean just be careful or be cautious? Does it just mean yes, broadly? It means weigh up the risks, think what the risks are, take care. So the duty of care is to take care, is broadly what prudence is saying. Some of the cases talk about people being reasonable and prudent, uh, although they don't discuss why they think there's a, is there a distinction between reasonable and prudent? Or is there, you know, are they adding things in there? And if you look at the, the Law Commission, again, going back in the 2014 paper, there's been a move away from this traditional language of prudence, got the statutory codification in 2000, the act signalled a move towards reasonableness as a relevant standard of, con of conduct. And I think that that's, if you're going to have this high level sort of duty that conveys something, then reasonableness is the better, the better test. It is pretty clear that prudence, even in the case law, doesn't mean risk free. You do that. There's an element of thinking, prudence means be very cautious, don't take risks. And that's not right. That, that would be a misreading of, of the case law and indeed the meaning of prudence. Uh, what ri but it does, that does mean you can take risks, but you need to be careful about them. You need to think about them. You need to analyze the risks. Uh, so I'll come back to this as being a sort of process duty. And that leads on, obviously, what risks are there? Should we, should trustee boards have thought about coronavirus and the effects? And they might have said, well, we could, but what would we do about it? And that sort of thing. So you end up with a Rumsfeldian type thing, known unknowns. There are things we know we know, and there are, we also know there are known unknowns. It's all vaguely confusing, but I suspect coronavirus was uh, a known unknown in the sense of we knew it could happen. Uh, we didn't actually know what it would do to markets or how badly it would come or when it would come. It's like there could be an earthquake, there could be a world war or something like that. There are all sort of these sorts of risks and issues out there. Um, and prudence doesn't mean risk free. So going back, the private client case, Justice Brightman, uh, it doesn't mean that the trustee is bound to avoid all risk and in effect act as an insurer. Okay. The distinction between a prudent degree of risk on the one hand and hazard on the other. So you get the cases talk about sort of speculation and hazard and things. It's all private client cases mainly, uh, which again sounds as though that's telling you something interesting. But what, what's a hazard? What's speculation? Uh, what, what's what? So uh, the vice chancellor in the Harry's case is a big charitable case. You've got to further the purposes of the trust seeking to obtain the maximum return, whether by income or capital growth, which is consistent with commercial prudence. Is this balance approach in there? Investments should be made solely on the basis of well-established investment criteria, having taken expert advice where appropriate, having due regard to such matters as the need to diversify the, the balance and that sort of thing uh, against risk and return. Then Asik and Drake, a, a recent Australian case, uh, Justice Edelman, who's now in the High Court, uh, referring back to this sort of hyster historic case law on prudence, the short point is that the refrain in the older cases about caution and avoidance of hazard if read in isolation, suggests a duty which is abstracted from the terms of the trust instrument and the nature of the trust business. But whether an investment is in course due to its speculative nature or impermissibly hazardous may be affected by the terms of the trust instrument. To give a simple example, uh, a trust established for the purposes of speculation with terms requiring investment in speculative ventures requires a different assessment of hazard from a trust which requires investment in government bonds. That, blinding the obvious in one sense but actually if you go back to the old case law and read them literally then they're talking about be very cautious um, and actually if you're overly cautious that can be imprudent uh, that can be reckless prudence when the parable of the talents I, I can't like this was the servant one of the servants invested and the other one just buried the talent in a pot or something and when the master came back he said that the cautious one hadn't hadn't done properly hadn't done it properly and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness 
there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So I'm, I'm expecting that in a judgment shortly. Um, and then we got the, the pensions regulator in a speech in 2012 that the then chair said, you, you've got to do things which are affordable. We do not want trustees to be recklessly prudent. This was talking about valuation assumptions, but even there, he's talking about recklessly prudent and we got statutory provision. And I quite like Wikipedia, although I couldn't find a source for this, uh, other than Wikipedia, which is probably my son doing it. Uh, the word has become increasingly synonymous with cautiousness. In this sense, prudence names a reluctant to state risks, which remains a virtue with respect to unnecessary risks, but when unreasonably extended into overcautiousness, can become the vice of cowardice. So there you go. So all this sort of stuff. So I, I, what's, what one person's hazard is another person's investment. So I, I think it comes down to I invest, you save, he speculates or gambles. So it all depends on your viewpoint in some ways. That, that what people talk of as, as clear dividing lines aren't in fact that clear when you, you look at them. So there are quotes from John Maynard Keynes and President Roosevelt saying that actually investing on the stock exchange is really the same as gambling. I think Theodore Roosevelt thought it, it was the same thing. Keynes actually thought it was even worse uh, investing on the stock exchange, didn't stop him doing it. Um, and then we get the pension schemes bill, which sort of says it's an offence of conduct risking accrued scheme benefits. So if you take a risk, and, and it doesn't say doing what, and it risks accrued scheme benefits, then that's going to be, if this is, is enacted, that's going to be a criminal offence, unless you do it well, reasonable, with reasonable excuse or something like that. So if you're a trustee investing in risky equities or some risky equities, well, it sounds as though that's probably reasonable, but, but actually you're needing to get within a reasonable excuse wrapper in order not to be guilty of a criminal offence, which doesn't strike me as very easy. So it sounds like a well-defined concept. It's a bit of a Twitter shortcut for reasonably or cautiously. Um, and and it, it's a similar issue that you have with other concepts that, that you, you can people use as though that has some sort of uh, clear meaning. So best interest, good faith is a notoriously difficult one. Fiduciary duty is flung around as meaning uh, doing practically anything or something like that. So what's a better way? Well, we go back to the 2000 Act, reasonable in the circumstances, special duties for professionals, implies looking at the context of the trust, how big is your trust, what's it trying to do, look at the times in which you are investing, what is everybody else doing, is this the right thing, is it sort of reasonable, uh, and who are you as the trustee, are you expecting some special duty uh, or, or not? Uh, and that's all similar to the Companies Act 2006, so the codification of the common law for director's duties, so reasonable care, skill and diligence with these things. So these are all similar sort of structures, I think, um, going through. So applying that, we have this as a high level duty of care. You've got to look at things like the context, the advice, it's a good judgment test. You're not actually having to, uh, you, you can't be second guessed just because you just because it didn't work out as well as you hoped doesn't mean you necessarily that was a breach of duty. Look at the time of the decision, look at diversification and the modern portfolio theory. That may be the difference between prudent man test and a prudent person test. Uh, and then uh, being a professional, you probably have a higher duty. I couldn't resist a quote from the Nestle or Nestle's case back in 1992. If only because it was Ted Nugy after whom these lectures are named. Mr. Nugy for the bank rightly stressed the duty of a trustee to act prudently. The best known formulation, this is the judgment in V. Whiteley. Okay, so that's against everything I've just said. But then uh, Lord Justice Dillon goes on, this principle remains applicable, fine. However wide or unlimited the scope of the investment clause, trustees should not be reckless with trust money, or reckless speculation, that sort of thing. Uh, but what the prudent man should do at any time depends on the economic and financial conditions of that time, not on what judges of the past, wherever eminent, have held to be the prudent course. It seemed to me that Mr. Nugy's submissions placed far too much weight on the actual decisions of the courts in the last century when investment considers conditions are very di different. So I think that, that, that is saying you look at what's going on now. And for directors, directors, you think they're a bit more entrepreneurial. Prudence isn't perhaps the right stand. If you go back far enough, you find prudence as the, the general rule for directors back in 1869. Uh, uh, but it's seen now as too cautious, uh, particularly this trilogy of Australian cases to look at director's duties. Uh, that's going to be relevant for trustee boards because in practice they'll be directors of a trustee company. Uh, they're going to owe duties to the company and potentially due to the beneficiaries if they're dishonest. 
and the level of duty is going to depend on on what the company should have been doing as a trustee so prudence doesn't really help tremendously for family wealth trusts what about commercial trusts unit trusts well we've had the the drake quote express investment why don't you put an express investment duty in the trustee saying this is what um this is how the trustee should invest this is what the duty of care is. i don't think people do i think it, i think they find it too difficult i've not seen that uh and they are different but in practice probably too late to say prudence isn't the right test but you just need to be careful about what prudence means if you use the word prudence it just means reasonable care so summarizing it's probably no more than careful or cautious it's probably mainly a process test. Think about what's going on, follow the statutory process so the guidance is there in the Pensions Act, take advice, consult, put it in the SIP, use a fund manager, that sort of stuff. Uh, consider the material relevant factors. And then some of the private client case law says you're only gonna be liable as a trustee even if you got some of that process wrong, if no reasonable or no prudent trustee would have acted that way. And that looks quite like a uh, 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 Wednesbury Braganza test, uh, and you see this in Nestle and Wright and Old Wang and Daniel and T, all private client cases. Uh, so it's probably process. It's pro and uh, but if you go really wrong, and and no reasonable decision maker would have invested ninety percent of the assets in gold or something, uh, then you need a book, um, which I would hardly recommend. Um, so what are we doing? No, no mention of prudence in the legislation other than the IOP. And that seems to have been ignored. What does prudence mean? It's probably take care, not much more than that. Um, it's a better way to describe the duty of care as being the reasonableness standard, applying the duty of care, look at the context and everything like that. Probably the same for pension trustees. And ultimately it ends up on a process and perversity test, similar to Braganza, back of course with your, your authorized investments and proper purpose and all that sort of stuff. So, there you go. So I'm, I'm going to start uh, hitting a button uh, if people start using the word Braganza. Uh, prudence. Or, or best interests uh, in, in meetings in the future. I've probably overrun. You haven't, David. That was a magisterial review. Um, and right at the end, a question has come in, which um, I am going to share and read so that the participants can see the question and, and you can read it while you think about the answer. So, from Philip Bennett. In an auction Wednesday, the country's debt management office said it sold 3.8 billion pounds worth of three-year gilts at a yield of negative 0.003%. This negative yielding bond means the British government is effectively being paid to borrow is it prudent for a pension scheme trustee to continue to hold gilts with a negative return when they could just sell the gilts and put the money on deposit? It's tricky to say you're being imprudent in investing in government gilts or something like that. Um, everything's got a risk in it. Uh, if you go back to the old 1880 cases, then, then they sort of say, well, you should hold on to all the investments yourself. I think you should keep a big box with one pound notes stuck in it or something like that. Uh, I think that's probably a bit imprudent. There's, there's risk all over the place. You give money to banks, give money to governments, then the, the, there's, there's a risk the government will default or inflation will rip. The, there are all sorts of risks going through there. I think you just got, yeah. I think the negative rate of return is, is just a factor you've got to do. I mean, it, that might be better than some other investment. There might be a more of a risk of a downturn or something else. You're, you're trading insurance for something else, aren't you? If you, it's like saying, why do I insure something? I'm just paying a premium, which must be a loss. But it, that's true, it is a loss if the risk doesn't come up. So it's, I think it's a balance of risk and reward. I'm not sure. I think going back to saying some things are automatically imprudent or improper or something like that is going back to the old days and it, and it doesn't apply anymore. Indeed, very good. Um, I bang on time. I think we'll hand over to Scott. Well, thank you, James. Um, and thank you to David and James and others for um, inviting me to present uh, 
well, this evening as it is for me, this morning as it is for you. Um, I don't have as many slides as, as David, um, but there is a written paper which has lots of footnotes and legal stuff in it, um, and that'll be available with the, with the other papers uh, when they become available to everybody. My presentation, unlike my paper, which is a bit more comprehensive, my presentation tries to take up where David's left off. That is, it doesn't really go back over the what is prudence type question. Um, rather, it takes a look at the experience we've had over the last six months, at the investment risks and the sorts of things that trustees have faced in both of our countries. Did that work? I seem to be unable to change the screen. Oh, yeah. Well, Judge Putnam in the US case of Harvard College and Amory famously noted in 1830, do what you will, the capital is at hazard. Now, I wasn't around then, but I have trouble believing that it was as traumatic a year as the year that we were having at the moment. In Australia, we started the year with a drought, moved quickly on to bushfires, and then um, shortly after that, large parts of the East Coast anyway had floods. I would choose in the context of this presentation to group those under a rubric that we might think of as products of climate change. We also, over the past six months, unfortunately, and are still going through the first serious pandemic in a century. And of course, Bitcoin, the third element of the three things I want to look at today, has had a bit of a roller coaster ride as well. Now, in choosing these three examples, climate change, pandemic, and Bitcoin, I've chosen them specifically because they help us to understand a little bit about the risks that pension fund trustees face and can help us to understand what prudence therefore has to grapple with. They are, as Donald Rumsfeld would say, known unknowns. That is, in each of these cases, we knew that the, there was a prospect of risk. There was a prospect of bad stuff happening. We didn't necessarily know when, we didn't necessarily know where these things would strike, but they weren't unknown unknowns. Each one though tells us a little bit about what our decision processes in pension funds need to accommodate and need to be able to address. So I, my presentation asks the question, are traditional notions of prudence sufficient? David's done a sterling job of going through the various um, developments, historical traje trajectory from uh, the, the lists to the involvement or the, the use of the notion of a duty of care and trying to understand what's appropriate um, way to regulate trustee investments using the duty of care and then more recently bringing in this um, notion of the best interests and then proper purposes. I'm not yet ready to go as far as mentioning brigands in a presentation but um, I'm sure David will uh, look forward to that at some point. Um, what developed out of that was a toolkit, a very limited toolkit of things you could do as a prudent investor, as a prudent trustee, to manage the investment risks that would occur in your portfolio. You would take care to try and find out all the information you could about the investment. You do research. Now research is expensive, so you couldn't do all the research you might want to do, but you would expend a certain amount of effort and time and resources into trying to find out as much information as you could about the investment op opportunities that were out there for you. That would help you to discharge your obligation to act carefully and to use care and exercise care in the exercise of your decisions. You'd also have diversification, including what the Americans have now managed to train us to talk about strategic asset allocation. What I mean, what I think of what I mean there is strategic asset allocation is a form of smart diversification. It's taking advantage of the lack of correlation between different investments in a way that is designed, in theory at least, to position you on the risk curve where that balance of risk and return is appropriate to the objectives of the fund that you have. We tend to forget also though that, that it's possible to take insurance out on specific risks and when you're holding specific physical assets that could be very important. So for instance you might insure the properties, the real property that you own um, and so on. Or you might take options, you might buy options to provide insurance over particular types of investment risk. Pretty much those are the things you can do traditionally 
as a trustee of a pension fund seeking to uh, act prudently in the investment exercise of your investment powers. I'm going to suggest to you that the extreme events that we've seen over the last six months highlight why that might be insufficient and that in fact a prudent investor would do some other things as well as those traditional use employ those traditional tools and in particular the complexity of the of pension schemes has grown enormously but what we have is we have a series of, of ways in which decisions are made which we've come to call governance and here i've described them as government structures and processes and i'm put, going to put it to you that these structures and processes are absolutely crucial for, de for dealing with, in a decisive way, in a timely way, the management of extreme risks in particular. They're actually important always, but in in when you're faced with extreme risks, the, um, it becomes additionally important that you pay attention to them and that you have them all uh, working well. Let's have a look at the different types of risk that we've seen. So we've got climate change. What do we know about climate change? Well it's likely to be slow moving, which means we might have time to take a variety of different steps. We don't necessarily have to do everything now, perhaps. We know that it's ubiquitous, which means we can't get out of the way. The fact that it's slow moving, by the way, means that we can try to stage how we, how we react to it in ways that ensure that the costs, if there are any of, of reacting, um, are spread and not all born instantly. The fact that it's ubiquitous means that diversification is probably not going to help us. It's probably the case that mitigation is expensive and it's certainly compounded by what economists would call a crisis of the commons, this idea that um, it's in no one's personal interests to go and sort out the problem, even though the collective interest would suggest that you ought to. And we know that trustees, the law requires them in both the United Kingdom and in Australia, to maintain a narrow focus on members' best financial interests. So they can't go off solving the problems of the world. They have to focus on how those problems might affect the narrow financial best interests of the members that they serve. So what's uncertain? Well, we don't know how quickly things will happen. And we don't know when, more particularly, we don't know when markets will react to those things. When they, in the Keynesian sense that was described earlier, when will the market recognize the risk and start to price it? We also don't know what the politicians might do in different countries. Various, um, there can be decisive moves, there can be lethargic moves, there can be re retracking, all sorts of things. And crucially, we don't know what peers are doing. So we don't know what other pension funds are doing. And if there are costs of mitigating climate change locally for a pension fund, the risk, certainly in a, in a DC world and in a choice world such as we have in Australia, is that the um, the trustee may be exposed as being imprudent because they're doing something different from what um, others are doing. So what can we do? Well, the traditional approach, which is the dot and gray, you identify potential winners like wind farms or other types of um, opportunities that seem to be well positioned in this environment. And you would ensure any specific risks that you had, perhaps as a, if you were owning a electricity distribution network, and you were worried that the bushfire might knock it out, then you might deal with that directly and, and, and take out insurance for that specifically. If you owned a large property somewhere, you might insure that property against certain types of risks as well that might be related to, to climate. But there are a whole range of governance th things that you can also do. You can require your investment managers to provide you with information about what's so how sorts of risks are developing or emerging across the, across the world. One of the things that um, I find very interesting is that pension fund trustees actually sit atop one of the most information rich environments in the private sector that's ever been created. They have more access to information. They can ask people more questions and expect to get better answers than almost anybody else in the history of civilization. So they should use that. You might want, if you're in a, in a DC world, to launch tailored ESG options. Why would you do that? Well, you would do that because it might assist certain members who feel particularly oriented towards this issue to have somewhere to go. The paper runs through a whole bunch of other governance issues that are a bit more subtle. Amongst them, 
suggestion about looking at the way board protocols actually affect decision making within a board. Now I'm thinking here primarily of corporate boards. So most large scale pension funds in Australia, and I think that's true in the UK as well, are um, governed by a corporate trustee where you have a board of trustees that makes many of the decisions. One of the things that, that happens there is that if it is costly to address um, climate change, it becomes very difficult for a board where members might have a short tenure, three years, five years or so on the board, or if they're all sitting at the same time and due for re-election or renomination at the same time. So one of the things that, that might be considered is carefully staging those across time and, and a variety of other sorts of measures that can ensure that institutional protocols and institutional memory is retained. You might also be careful to communicate with members. We have a case in front of uh, courts that come up in November here, where uh, an individual member, um, seems, it seems to me is grandstanding, but is, is attempting to argue that the trustee of one of our larger industry funds um, called REST is, uh, has not had regard, close enough regard to climate change. Well, one of the easiest ways to address some of that is to make sure that you communicate with members what they are in fact doing. And I think one of the outcomes of that case will be that that trustee will demonstrate that they are in fact doing a wide range of things um, that the member doesn't realize. But in the meantime, you have this PR and other issue where the, where rest, the rest trustee is being brought before the courts and, and, and across public opinion um, as having perhaps not done that. The other thing that you can do, which is perhaps a little sounds a bit cynical, but is trustees can join things like the UNPRI and various other climate change bodies. And the reason that you would do that, apart from the, perhaps trying to promote the, the norms that they have, is also to try to encourage others to, to do the same thing that you're doing. And that's helping to address this issue of not wishing to take peer risk. Because remember that when we start to look at what's prudent in the context, as David described, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to look at what everybody else does. That's one of the measures of prudence. Well, if everybody is dealing with this issue more or less in the same way, the risks of being divergent are much lower. So climate change, we're all trying to grapple with it, but it seems to me that the, the traditional investment prudence tools are not enough. You need to be doing a bit more, or you could be doing a bit more. When we get to COVID-19, we get a slightly different situation. The pandemic that we're experiencing was not a question of if, there's been lots of people talking about the prospect and potential for a viral pandemic at some point. It was more about when. That's a different type of risk than the slow moving risk we saw with climate change. It's also very fast moving. It's fast moving in the same way that something like the uh, liquidity crisis in 2007, 2008 was fast moving. It requires people to make decisions quickly, to revise, to react, to continue to be on top of information very quickly in a way that's very different than what we saw in cl the climate change example. It is somewhat predictably viral insofar as the underlying virus is understandable, but not necessarily the impact that that has on financial markets. And one thing that people seem to have forgotten, although I've got a very fetching picture there of, uh, of a senior member of your, of your government, um, is that it can affect decision makers personally in a way that is quite different than say climate change, which people can abstract from and make rational decisions about perhaps. Something like COVID-19 has the capacity to really affect individual decision making and ultimately our boards of directors are actually comprised of individuals. So where is the uncertainty? Well, we don't know how long it's going to take to find a, um, a cure or a vaccine. We don't know what members will do. In Australia, we, we've, we have, in many cases, the ability to switch portfolios. And so many of our members have actually switched into cash, causing all sorts of illiquidity problems within portfolios that um, may be not rational, but that's what that's what's, the trustees are having to deal with. And we also don't know, again, how the politicians are going to react, and not just in our country, but in other countries as well. Now, in both our jurisdictions, Trustees are expected to have a disaster recovery plan in place, but really that's only dealing with operational issues. They're probably also going to have a pretty well-developed liquidity management plan, but question whether they've accounted for catastrophe risk. 
certainly in Australia, if you'd suggested to people that they were going to have to find $2 billion in the course of a couple of days of cash to hand back to members, they would have been horrified and surprised. But in fact, that's actually what's happened in Australia. What that also means though, and what I'm suggesting is, is like in the case of climate change, you need to have procedures, governance procedures that are going to work. And in particular, things like switching procedures are very important. You need to be able to harness that information network. And in this case, unlike in the previous case, your governance structures and processes have to ac accommodate quick decision making. You're going to have to have appropriate delegations in place so that you can have some, perhaps a, a, a committee dedicated to investments might be, look, might be looking at the investment aspects of this, but you might also have a, a, a member claims committee um, and some other, and a, a communications committee that are empowered to actually make decisions. The best way for something to grind to a halt in this space, in, this, in the face of this risk, is if the board of directors attempts to try to answer every question themselves. It's simply not possible for a small number of people acting probably part-time to stay on top of everything continuously in the face of a risk like COVID. Different for climate change, but COVID is, has a, the dynamics of that risk are rather different. My third risk, I was grand, in a grandiose way talking about cyber risk, but in particular, I wanted to focus on there are lots of aspects of cyber risk, obviously, but I, I was, today I was primarily going to talk about Bitcoin or about cryptocurrencies. What do we know about these? They're very trendy. I did have a picture of Kim Kardashian on this slide, but I vowed never to do that again, so I'd got rid of her. Um, they are very trendy. And in most common law jurisdictions, there are this creeping in cases which talk about them being an asset in one context or another. And in some, some of those jurisdictions, they've even been recognized as being something that's capable of being held on trust. So they are potentially within that, in the realm of being purchased by pension fund trustees, potentially. We do know they've had extreme price volatility just in this year alone. They've halved in price and then bounced back to their original level in the course of just over two months. That's not an unusual sort of a trajectory for price change for cryptocurrencies. There are some who say, and they'd be correct on the mathematics, but not maybe not in the investment, uh, the deeper investment rationale, that that volatility actually gives an opportunity for diversification. I'd suggest that's not a great idea, and here's why. There's not really any clarity as to why that unpredictability arises. There's a lack of transparency about what's the price of these, um, these assets, if you want to call that, these, these cryptocurrencies. They typically happen on thin trading volumes relative to the, most of the markets that we would see, certainly the, the major currency markets. We know there is custody risks. People die and don't tell anybody what their, um, what their pin is. They lose them. Um, there's no way of actually um, being sure about that. There's also um, obviously examples of, of um, wallets being hacked and so on. So there's a, there's a custody risk there. And there's a scandal risk that I think people miss or underestimate, which is that where you don't know who the other parties are who are engaged in this marketplace, you could wake up and discover the front page of the Financial Times that your fund has invested in something that is also financing terrorism, pedophilia, or some other um, practice with which you don't want to be associated. My summary of all of this is actually fairly straightforward. I would just avoid them. But the, re the reason I'm bringing this up is again, this is a particular type of risk, has a particular type of set of characteristics to it, which trustees need to work through. Those tools that you had of, um, of diversification probably get you, in the wrong, get you to the wrong answer in this case. But however, the need to research and to act carefully would tell you that this is actually a, an issue, that, this, that there's, a problem, there's a problem with this type of investment. And I think that's, pro that's probably a relatively prudent position to take. So the conclusion is that I think in the face of these extreme risks of the volatility of, of cryptocurrencies, of the way in which COVID and potentially future pandemics develop, in the encroachment into our understanding of how the world works of, of, of uh, climate change, 
that traditional notions of prudence, and particularly the traditional tools that we would use to deal to prudently are outgunned. And actually what you need to be doing in order to act prudently is not purely focused directly on the investments that you're making or even why you're making them, but also your capacity to respond decisively. And that in turn is dependent on the governance structures and processes that you have in place within your fund, within the corporate trustee. So that's things like delegations to appropriate expert subcommittees, and by delegations, incidentally, I don't just mean referrals um, or um, to, to groups that will come back and make recommendations. I mean genuine delegation of decision making, which is possible within a corporate structure. Not, not so easy within an um, individual trustee structure, but it is possible within a corporate structure. You need to have risk frameworks that don't rely on the mathematics or the statistics of modern portfolio theory, but actually recognize the broader dimensions in which risk can actually be understood and are understood today. You want to have a, managed, a, a um, management information systems that collect the information in a, in a timely manner, in a comprehensive manner, and deliver them in a comprehensible manner to the board of, of trustees or the board of the, of the corporate trustee. One of the things I've been amazed at over the 30 odd years that I've been advising pension funds is how poor the information that they get is relative to the amount of information that's actually out there and that they could in fact use to make better decisions. I suggest also that this notion of institutional memory is very important. In Australia, we've seen the development of a managerial group within some of the big funds starting to um, starting to be built up and they not the not the trust not the trustees not the directors of the trustee it's the managers who now who have the institutional memory in australia and that's that's not necessarily ideal what you want is the whole institution to have um, a, a memory of what's gone on why things are done the way they are um, and where where risks might lie I th i'm going to throw in as well that part of being prudent in face of these risks is product design particularly in the DC world, ensuring that your investment menu can, is conducive to good decision making, that your switching in unit pricing is conducted in a way that's efficient, but also fair and robust and can survive the sorts of stresses that we may have seen over the last six months, certainly in Australia. And I want to come back to that final point. Member communications in all of this are crucial, not just because you want, don't want people suing, you don't want your members taking action, but also because they help to set expectations and to allow people to themselves make decisions around the pension scheme of which they're a member. Those are all, I would term them governance style issues. And that I think brings me to the end of my 25 minutes or perhaps slightly, slightly over 25 minutes. Apologies for that. Um, as I say, there's a, there is a paper that does it, that describes all of this and has lots more law in it than I've used in the, in the, in the past, past couple of minutes. Um, but I'm happy to take questions. James, over to you. Scott, Scott, so I've got one question which picks up on the theme in, in your slides that uh, one of the key um, aspects of dealing with extreme risks is to get the governance and processes right so that you can respond nimbly if and when mm -hmm. a, a low probability event arises. And, and the question is, assume that the trustee board has got, got in place a, a fit for purpose or even best in practice, um, best, best practice set of processes. What, how can they sense check whether they're spending the right amount of time, bearing in mind the listed issues that trustees have to deal with for their scheme, the, the right amount of time on these, a definition, low probability, but high impact risks? That's that's the million dollar question, isn't it? It's uh, how, how do you know if you're spending enough time? I think the starting point for me in my observation of um, I spent five years in, in the UK two decades ago um, and my time since then um, and before then in, in Australia is that most trustee boards when faced with complex decisions or scary decisions, decisions involving risk, um, try to hold them to them, try to try to make sure that they're involved. And I actually think that's the wrong instinct in most of this. 
not that you try, should try to avoid being <laughs> across the risk, but actually when, when, when these sorts of things start to happen, it's re that's when you really need to be able to draw on the broader set of expertise and to really comp compartmentalize the decision-making such, such that the appropriate decision-makers can spend enough time on each, each component of it and not have, um, you know, whatever it is, six or 10 or 12 directors as they, as they typically are in Australia, trying to get their heads across everything. Um, and that's, that's where the teamwork comes in. That's where board dynamics come in. You really need to be able to, to trust the, um, the other board members to be doing their parts of the, of the, of the role appropriately. Um, that of course assumes that the regulators are, are um, happy for that. In, in Australia, we have a problem that the regulator assumes that the direct, that the board will do absolutely everything. And we're trying desperately to um, wean them off that particular view that, that, that there is a need for um, delegation, distribution of decision-making and such so that, so that you can respond sensibly and effectively. That's I'm not sure if David has any, any thoughts on that from his experience. There's, there's a problem there's a problem in in the UK in the sense that the, the regulatory structure includes a specific provision saying that trustees shouldn't take day-to-day -day investment decisions they've got to mm -hmm. delegate that to a fund manager uh, or, or they need to be a, reg, a regis, regulated entity under the financial services legislation which in practice most of them aren't over here so you tend to have to delegate so it's imposing a level of of, of, of complication between this being able to be nimble and do stuff and actually you can't do it because you need to take advice and you need to delegate it to a fund manager to do it you need, to, you need to, to, need to make it, but i'm not suggesting you need to take day-to-day -day decisions so much as you need to engage in a very granular way with the with the decisions the high level decisions you're not you're not trying to choose whether whether to buy or sell a particular company or to buy at a particular price or so on that that's not what i'm saying what i'm saying is if you're trying to work out how to communicate with members about um what's going on in terms of covid then that's that's actually quite a complex question and you know doing it well will make a big difference doing it poorly could also make a big difference you don't want the people who are thinking about that also worrying about how to ensure liquidity management is working or how to try to make sure that you're getting um, the, uh, the contributions in on time. That's, it's a, that, that's more of what I'm, what I'm talking about. I'm not suggesting that you should be trying to get in and remake every single decision within the portfolio. That, that yeah, would actually- The balance between the day-to-day -day stuff and the yes, speedy yes. direction and the tactical and-, and, and I, think you, I think you need to assume that the day-to-day -day stuff that the investment managers are doing is directed towards the guidance that you've given them. And, you know, you need to have that, that's some, to some extent, that's where your MIS is going to become really important to be able to be confident that that's, that's actually happening without having to spend a lot of time pouring over every you know, transaction and every report that you get. Hmm. But what, what you might've set up as your state university principles at the end of last year, you might say, well, I should be monitoring that and thinking about, you know, mm -hmm. that right in the context of COVID and things like that. Yep. But it's quite difficult for trustees to act terribly nimbly on, on that sort of stuff because they need advice and things like that. And things move very fast. As you say. And, that, and that's, that's my point. Yes, it is. If, if, the the I, more you can do to make that work, the better. I, w I was thinking of your slide on Bitcoin about you don't know who you're dealing with, there's no liquidity, uh, and the, the values go up and down, and it's all not very transparent. Isn't the same true on private equity? Um, and, and yet we sort of think private equity might be all right, but Bitcoin feels a bit more racy. Um, well, there'd be, there'd be certain hedge funds and certain private equity vehicles that I would probably put in exactly the same category. Um, and, that's, and that's one of the reasons why um, 10 years ago in Australia, we introduced um, an obligation that trustees have a reliable valuation um, that they could, they could turn to. Um, and that's actually a, it's one of the covenants that's, that's in there. And the reason, and the reason for that is very simple. We would, we were interview, I was part of the group that was interviewing, um, people in the industry and they were saying, but we don't know what these things are valued. We just give them the money and then they tell us what, what, what return we've got, which sent shivers up the spines of all of the policy makers in the room. And so the, um, yeah, the, those things are, those things are a problem and trustees ought to be thinking very carefully about whether that's appropriate or not. I, I, I see the time. We haven't responded to every question that's come in, but we'll, we'll, we'll get in touch separately um, in relation to those, uh, as I think it's now 
really time to wrap up. Um, so let me briefly just take the opportunity to remind you all of, of two things. First, as is the case for all the lectures in this series, more detailed companion papers are being provided and a collection will be published uh, in due course. Secondly, uh, there is one more lecture in this year's series and on Tuesday of next week, the 30th of June, Michael Furness QC, Robert Hamm QC and Jonathan Davey QC will be talking about tax. I understand that invitations for that have, have already gone out, so please do sign up if you haven't already or get in touch if you have any questions about that event. And with that, that let me thank again David and Scott for their magnificent presentations uh, and thank you thank you all for joining us thank you